Hello and welcome to episode 21 of the chess.com rapid rating climb series. Facing an opponent, I have no idea what that is. Is that just the European Union? Yeah, it's just the European Union. <laughs> so he could be anywhere in Europe apart from England or the rest of the UK because we are no longer in Europe. If you're new to the channel, my name is Alex. I'm rated between 1950 and 2000 classical ELO. If you check my fee day, well, you don't know my surname, so you can't even check that anyway, then it will not say that because I am with the English Chess Federation, which is equivalent to fee day, but doesn't actually work in conjunction with fee day necessarily. And therefore, my chess.com rapid rating should probably be around, or uh, if not more, than my official video rating. So that's what this series is about, just getting that up and then explaining to you guys my thought process as I play. So you get education out of it, I get rating out of it, and everyone's happy. So we have a Vienna Gambit, which happened while I was introducing myself, for those of you who are new to the channel. And in the Vienna Gambit, d5 is the main move, and you take on e5, which forces knight takes e4. And from knight takes e4, there are two moves. There is queen f3, and there is knight f3. I play queen f3. Queen f3 is what I would recommend. I think, well, no, I don't think, I know it's also what Gotham Chess recommends in his course, which I recommend the course as well. He doesn't go over absolutely everything in all of the openings he recommends, but it gives you a great baseline. If you have those courses already, and you're watching this video, Hopefully I can provide some further detail on some of the themes of the openings that I play, because a lot of them are from the course. My opponent takes on c3, and I'm going to take back with the b-pawn. I expect queen h4 check, g3, queen e4 check, which forces a queen trade, and is the main line of the Vienna gambit, or at least one of the main lines of the Vienna gambit. Of course, he doesn't have to do this. Another popular move is bishop e6, bishop e7. c5 is also popular, trying to discourage white from playing d4. Against c5, I like to play bishop b5 check, and then play knight to e2, so that d4 is now on the cards, because after takes takes, bishop b4 doesn't work, because c3 is now supported by the knight. With me? With me. He doesn't go for any of the options. So like I said, bishop e7, bishop e6, queen h4 check, and c5 are the main moves. He doesn't choose any of them. He goes to knight to c6. This is, I believe, a straight-up mistake. Not quite a blunder, but more than an inaccuracy. It should be a mistake, which we will check in the post-game review. But the problem is, after I now go d4, the knight is out of the game. My C pawn controls the knight's movement forward here, and my D pawn controls the E5 square. If the knight goes to A5, that's stupid. I mean, what, are you going to go to C4? Scary. <laughs> like, that's not doing anything. And the problem is, the knight is essentially out of the game. You may be able to try and reroute it through E7, but that will block off the bishop's development, and the bishop is already suffering a chronic lack of space right so the knight so the move knight c6 is bad because you should be playing c5 if you want to go knight c6 so that you actually can challenge for the dark squares but in the same way that a lot of queen's pawn openings you play c4 before knight to c3 which is a common idea right is so that your knight can work in conjunction with your pawn to attack the center here black can't do that d-pawn is nice, but this wedge is essentially unbreakable, unless he can play e5, or maybe f6 in some cases. Common ideas of the of the Vienna gambit. So, 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 so. Let's develop. Bishop d3, knight to e2, and castle looks like a very uh, natural development plan, and it's probably what we're going to go for. Now, at all times, you have to watch out for f6. You have to make sure that f6 is not playable. This is one of the reasons that bishop d3 is a good move, because if f6 and queen g6, then g6 takes, takes, takes. But you have to remember he put a bishop on e6. So if bishop g3 
f6, queen to h5. The bishop can drop back to f7. He does not have to play g6. I'm not entirely sure about that position. So, how am I going to go about doing this? It's making me potentially want to play knight to e2. So that we can meet f6 with knight f4 attacking the bishop. And if the bishop retreats, then we can push the pawn. Also, we have mad pressure on d5 then. Now, we could do it in this move order, but I'm not sure if we're too slow. So, bishop d3, f6. Of course, he doesn't have to go f6, but I think that's the move that you should calculate, because that's the most forcing move, right? And there, I'm not sure what we should do. I'm not sure what the plan is, because again, queen h5, bishop f7. So... I'm inclined to play knight e2, then knight f4, and then get the bishop to d3, just because of that specific move order. So I hope you were able to follow along with that well. Hopefully I will cover that in the post-game analysis if I remember. But my old setup, I've got like a whiteboard just behind my camera, so I could just like jot notes down. But this is my uni setup, like while I'm at uni, so I don't have that luxury. Could I have a piece of paper where I write things down? Almost certainly yes. In fact, in fact, let me do that right now. Why don't I just do that? I'm sure I've got a notepad here. Give me one second. Okay, yeah, I actually do have a notepad now. This is um, this is some top class YouTube, right? I think I deserve a subscription for this. Whoa, what is that move? Okay, well, I'm just gonna note on move eight, Bishop d3 f6 so we're going to check that after the game the move g5 i mean that stops the knight from coming here but what i can just go to g3 that's an insane move no, that that can't be good that, that, that can't be good no way no way we're just going to go bishop d3 and castle as normal. I wouldn't encourage black to castle queen side. We might not even attack him on the queen side. We might still attack on the king side if he goes queen side. But like here, we could play rook b1, but he castles all the same. So maybe like bishop d3, castle queen side, he chooses h6. Now, h6, I think, runs into knight to h5, because we're threatening to come into f6, and bishop g7 isn't playable, because we control g7. So if he goes bishop e7 to defend f6, we can just jump to g7, give him a check. This loses a bishop, so his only move would be king to d7. And then take, take. Then he's bringing the rook to the f file, though. So I don't want to take the bishop. Knight h5, bishop e7, knight g7 check, king d7. Maybe I can just play move like rook b1 and go after b7. And if we can encourage king to c8, then he will lock his own rook out of the game. Which looks pretty tempting. Now, we could just go bishop d3. We could go rook b1 first, actually, though. Ooh, yeah, I think I like this. If we go rook b1 first, he has to respond to the threat. So if he plays like rook b8, and then we have the same move order with this then i feel like the king is a bit more stranded i feel like he's a bit worse off because he's gonna s after rook b1 he can't play king to c8 there so he's got to commit the rook if he plays b6 then i i have a feeling that's losing because there's no way you can weaken your light squares that much and get away with it 
no chance because then our light square bishop will become an absolute monster especially if we trade the knight off for the bishop right that would give us more of a reason to do that because we can bring our bishop in along the light squares so i hope that made sense to you if you're getting value from this video so far or if you just find it entertaining i'd appreciate you dropping a like and subscribe and please comment like any questions you have about the game in general because i'm here to educate like that's the point and you know if you find it fun at the same time then great but primarily it's to educate okay so queen z it does the same job it defends b7 knight to f5 is now not a move because the queen and the bishop control it but i wasn't intending on going to f5 anyway we go here again same thing check king can go to d8 but this looks incredibly good for me also this queen might be kind of overloaded if we do take this bishop he's not going to be able to take back the queen he's going to have to be take back with the pawn because otherwise we're going to pick up b7 if he takes with the queen right i have a feeling he might have missed knight to h5 he might have missed it and i just don't understand our opponent's play like he just wasted two moves pushing pawns on the king side for what like to go g4 i'm just going to move my queen i am aware this move existed in this position to attack the rook and force probably rook to g8 and maybe we can pick this up but also if um queen f6 he could play rook h7 but then we have bishop d3 so maybe that was actually a better line actually no we can't pick up h6 the bishop defends it what am i on about i will note it down though um i'll move 11 queen to f6 maybe that was a better idea but it feels natural for me to go knight to h5 to if nothing else trade off the light square bishop for the knight and try and exploit the weak light squares and if this pawn ends up taking here squares like g6 are going to be very oh my god are going to be very vulnerable right if we do something like this and the pawn takes and also we're going to stop him from castling so we tick two boxes with the move knight to h5 he could not really react and let the knight into f6 but that feels worse than allowing the knight into g7 not only because we're going to attack d5 but i feel like the knight is just an absolute monster and he is going to let us do that surprisingly he does defend d5 with that move though however knight to f6 the king has to go to d8 i like the move bishop a3 just trying it's not simple actually maybe that's a good move but it is very cramped now we don't actually have to give this check we don't actually have to do that because black can't actually stop us from delivering this check because we'll take the bishop now he could play a move like knight g8 on the next turn to defend f7 but that looks suicidal because where's your development here we could like queen f6 attacking the rook if rook to g8 then do we have anything i don't think so don't think so maybe bishop a3 takes 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 trying to play for knight f6 we could start with bishop a3 though we could start with that and 
the move bishop g4 doesn't work because knight f6 forks the bishop and the queen. Sorry, and the um, king. So that's not a move. So let's play bishop a3 again. This, this. You could actually, if you wanted to be fancy, take first and after queen takes, then knight f6, pick up the queen. But I'd rather keep my queen on the board. I'd just take with the knight. Um, because black's king is in some trouble in this position. Our bishop looks very nice on this long diagonal. This bishop at some point is probably going to come out to d3. But there's no rush. Once it does, we're going to be able to castle kingside and get the rook onto the uh, f-file, which could be quite useful. But again, we don't have to do that yet. Black's position is incredibly cramped. Knight g6 offering a trade of bishops. Okay. It also defends the rook, so queen f6 doesn't come with as much venom. Okay, okay. What if we take? Well, if we take, then king takes, and then this is a move. Because we won't have knight f6, because the king will be on f8. So, instead, I propose that we give this check now to get control of g4 with tempo on the king. And then we make a decision. Now we make a decision. And my decision, I believe, is going to be taking. Bearing in mind all of these dark squared weaknesses, now we've traded off dark squared bishops, they could be even more problematic to deal with for black. Now, the d5 horn is straight up hanging here. Straight up hanging. If bishop takes, queen takes, queen here, takes, takes, takes at the very worst, we come off two pawns to the good with what looks like a winning position. Knight takes. You're also potentially threatening to play a move like queen f6, which could be pretty bad for black. Maybe bringing a bishop out to like c4. Maybe to d3 to target the knight. This looks good. This knight may be coming into f4 as well. So our knight would control that square. This looks like a good move. I'm going to do it. I don't think we're putting ourselves in any danger. This queen is also kind of tied down to the defense of this pawn. And if a move like queen d7 is played, then knight to back to f6 attacks the queen and opens our own queen up on b7 because this pawn is now removed from our queen, like from blocking our queen's scope. So, yeah, this looks, you know, incredibly winning, but we have to prove that. Now we are up a pawn, so if everything gets traded off for whatever reason, we're up a pawn, you know. But there's no need to be trading everything off just yet. I think we can get at least another pawn for our troubles. And two pawns, at two pawns up, I might trade everything for the sake of simplicity. But if I see good attacking options, then of course I'll try and make my opponent or win significant amounts of material. Remember, not every attack has to end in checkmate. If you win two pawns even, that's a pretty successful attack. If you believe you can then convert that in the end game, or if you win like a piece or something, then why not trade everything off and win the end game? Obviously, a tiny minority of those situations, you might not want to trade everything because black's pieces might get too active or something. But if the queens come off the board, it should be a simple job if you're up, you know, say two pawns or a knight or something like that. Position's very tough for my opponent because there is not a whole lot of moves for him. This rook can't really do anything. The queen can't really do anything. Again, if the queen comes to d7, the knight just returns to f6. And the queen is does not have many squares. This rook also can't do a whole lot. It's kind of just stuck doing defensive duties. And he also can't open up the f-file. 
because if he plays f6, we're just going to take with the knight and close the file off with a piece. This knight could maybe get into the game to a square like f4, but we will take it if he does that. If he does takes takes with the intention of coming to f4, his king is under too much of an attack currently, and the queens will probably get traded before he can activate his knight. So like I said, queen d7, I believe knight f6 is good. He might be intending queen to a4, but I think we can probably just take on b7, attack the rook, and black looks like he's really suffering. Um, I was just checking this, but I don't think that's great. So let's just return here. The 80 pawn is hanging, but he can't take it just yet because his queen is under attack. Oh, he's going to offer me a queen trade. Wow. If we take, then take. We have a very nice position. Don't get me wrong. But I feel like we might be able to do a bit better. We could play rook takes b7. He can't take here because our queen defends it. And the, and the rook is defended by the queen via x-ray. But I also just noticed the move d5. Sometimes these simple tactics can kind of skip over your mind in these complicated positions. But d5 is just a fork. Defended by the knight and the queen. So we have two defenders to his two attackers. d5. Again, c3 is defended by the queen. The rook can't be attacked by his queen. Nothing else in our position is vulnerable. There's no checks on our king. This looks like it wins a piece. Just checking. Haven't missed anything. If here, here. There, there, there. There we go up a piece. So that's pretty damn good to me. And same with knight takes e5. We take, he takes, we take, he takes, and we're up a piece. For a couple pawns, but I mean, we're already up a pawn, so we're basically up a piece in that position. Although our king looks a bit exposed, because black's pieces are so passive, he can't really take advantage of it. His queen is pretty much dominated. The, o the only safe squares for the queen are c5 and a4. Every other square is defended by one of our pieces. Okay, and he goes this route. Route? I'm not American. Route. <laughs> so yeah, we take the queen. Just checking there's nothing better. Don't believe there is. Let's take. Knight takes, pawn takes. And again, like I said, the attack does not have to end in checkmate. We can just win a ton of material, which is exactly what we've just done. We're up a whole piece. So, now to convert the position. He is attacking a2 with his bishop. What are we going to do about it? Well, we could go c4. That blocks off a lot of lines. We can then go bishop d3 potentially and like knight to e4. That looks kind of promising. We could play rook b2, but I don't want the rook having to defend this pawn. We could also just play a3 or a4. Maybe... Maybe a3 just to keep the pawn on the dart square. This isn't scary because then we just move the rook. That looks good to me. Let's just go a3. Let's preserve the pawn. Because we don't want to give him a passed a pawn, right? There's absolutely no reason to do that. I preferred that to c4 because the c4 pawn still remains a target. And I wanted to leave my bishop's scope open just in case. I want to bring it over there. Let's drop our knight back because it's attacked by the king. Our opponent's going to get aggressive, which is very common when, um, you know, the position is not looking that good. If knight c5 attacking the bishop, bishop to d5 attacking our f3 pawn. Let's 
kind of annoying. I don't really want to play bishop g2. It looks very passive. Although bishop d g2 castles, f4. Mm. Let's not take a year on this like I normally do. Easier said than done. We could go knight to d2 to defend f3 preemptively and prepare bishop to c4, offering a trade of bishops. That I like. That I like. I think that's a more accurate response. Okay. Now we offer a bishop trade. Black cannot refuse this, which is important. Because, well, well, I mean, he can. He can go bishop d7 or bishop c8, but that's probably worse than trading the bishops. Maybe it keeps more practical chances, but d7 just blocks the d-file for black. And our bishop is really strong now. And c8 disconnects his rooks. And since this rook can't challenge us on the b-file because we'll win a rook, it essentially puts his rook out of the game if he plays bishop to c8. So it looks pretty good. Pretty good position. If he takes, then our knight on c4 will also monitor the d2 square, which will be useful. Yeah, this looks really, really cramped now. I mean, it might, it might be the best way to keep practical chances alive for black, just because you're keeping more pieces on the board. But king f2, I want to play like rookie 1. h4 is a move, but I don't want to allow g4, really. Because I want to meet g4 with f4. And if we have our pawns on h4, then g4, then f4, then this pawn is a passed pawn. And we're still winning, don't get me wrong. But we're giving black unnecessary chances, right? So I want to meet g4 with f4 and just lock the king side down. That attacks our knight. Let's go rook to d1. I bring I want to bring the h rook and not the a rook because I want sorry the b rook because I want the b rook to keep his rook in jail. Yeah, we were threatening here knight to e4 check picking up his rook, which is why he plays bishop d7 so that that is not a move. But we could just infiltrate now. If rook b7, threaten c7, look at a7. Looks good to me. Looks good to me. We're trying to cramp his position as much as possible. As much as possible. If he plays a move like this, then we're not going to trade. We're going to take. Because if he comes to b2, we're going to play bishop b3 and lock his rook in jail. And then we're going to win it with knight c4. Right? That's the idea. So while after rook b8, your instinct might be to trade rooks or to double rooks up to force him to take you, calculation is the most important thing. Because whilst it looks scary that he's invading, it's not actually a threat. So he plays bishop e8, connecting his rooks once again, so this does not work because the rook is defended by the other rook. But I think we can just go pawn grabbing at this point. grab ourselves a pawn for our troubles. This rook can't really venture anywhere because their knight e4 will be a move. Yeah, I'm not worried about him invading. We could play this preemptively. We could. We could also just take on a7. Because he can't bring his rook in, not only because it will get trapped, but because rook b2 walks off of the defense of his d-rook and walks into this fork. Well, not fork, discovered attack. Because after takes, we take the rook, right? If his rook leaves the defense. Understand me? Awesome. I think, I think you're probably smart enough to understand if you stuck around this far in the video. You probably understand a fair bit about chess if you've been listening to me waffle on about it for like half an hour at this point. And that's not even including the post-game analysis because, um, you know, we will be doing that after the game is over and, you know, I've probably won. It'd be kind of embarrassing if I managed to lose this, but it would not be unheard of. Okay, yes, he blunders. Again, we can play bishop b3 and trap the rook like that. But we can also just play rook e4. Sorry, knight e4. 
picking up the rook. I don't see any reason not to. Rook, uh, queen to e, king to e7. Defending the rook isn't a move because our rook controls that square. So we win the rook. This comes with a check. But... Bishop e2 looks good. His bishop can't do anything to take advantage of our bishop. He can play that though. And he is now threatening f3. So if we take, he's going to win our bishop. Admittedly, I kind of missed that. But... Here, here. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe I messed up there a little bit. What about this? Just defending f3. You know what? That looks kind of good. Let's give this check. Let's give this check. The king can't advance to attack my rook because my rook cuts it off. My other rook, right? So, because otherwise it would just be a bad move. King moves. And this move makes a lot of sense to me. If you take, then I just take on e4. And I'm good. If king e3 and you take here, then I just take. And if rook takes on c3, then king f2. And if you give me another check, then king g3. And I'm good. I've got myself into some unnecessary trouble here, which is very characteristic of me. But king e3 looks pretty winning. We might be able to force some trades as well, because we are just up a rook. If we have to sack a pawn or two to trade off some pieces, then so what? So what? We're up a whole rook, and we have a passed a pawn, which is going to be a very quick moving pawn. Especially because his king is all the way on the other side of the board to the promotion square. He goes this, which take on e4. Thank you very much. f3 is now very nicely defended. And the bishop is no longer under attack. There are also mating ideas. If we can play bishop d3 with the king out of the way, his king has no moves. Because we're cutting him off from both of these angles. And his own pawns and bishop are cutting him off like this. He might have noticed that, which is why he plays g4. But can't we just take and win his bishop? I don't see what I'm missing. His bishop's trapped. Looks pretty trapped to me. Anyway. <laughs> so yeah, that's probably just a desperate move in fairness. And I mean, you might as well try silly tactics at this point because the game is over. Check. Is there a mate? There's got to be a mate. Check. Why is there no mate? Excuse me? Check. Oh, no, there is. Check and mate. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay, that was a very solid game. Uh, I think played very well. I really can't be dissatisfied with any of that, to be honest. Let's get into the post-game analysis. All right, the game review gives us an incredible accuracy score of 89.6. Our opponent with 76.8. And we only had one inaccuracy that whole game, apparently. So I'm not sure why our accuracy isn't higher, actually. But whatever. I'm not going to complain about that. Game starts with e4, e5, knight c3, knight f6, and f4, the Vienna Gambit. If you take, then e5. This knight cannot advance on this side of the board and can't advance in the center. So it's forced back to g8. And after knight f3 stopping queen to h5, 
the position is better for the white pieces. Computer says point three, but it's very difficult to play. Because after a move like d6, I like to play like this line with bishop c4. And if you take, then knight takes e5. And it's pretty, de it's pretty devastating. After like queen h4, king f1. This is very hard to defend against with moves like d4 coming in. Or you can even play safer, like I have many times with castles here. Just giving two pawns up. And while the computer prefers black, I would take white here any day. You know, moves like d4, moves like rook e1, bishop f4 coming in, maybe knight e5 or knight g5 at the right moment. Very difficult. So, d5 is the main move. After takes and knight takes, you can play knight f3, but the problem is that black doesn't have to take you. He can just play a move like bishop e7. If you take black, then, you know, your knight's forced back and you're just worse. So I believe the move is d3 here, trying to force black to take you. And you get a very similar position with this pawn chain being built up. But I feel like you can do this at a much faster rate if you start with queen to f3. Because queen f3 actually pressures the knight to make a decision. Because if black does, you know, if black plays bishop e7, like in the knight f3 variation, then you just win a pawn. Right? So black can't allow that. Anyway, he takes on c3. B takes c3. And one of the main moves is queen to h4 check. And this forces the queens off the board. Because after g3, queen e4 takes, takes. It's a queenless middle game, essentially. It's probably a little bit better for white. Because you can argue that e4 is weaker than e5. I have had this in a classical game against a guy rated like 2200. And I won in like 25-ish moves. One of my favorite games I've played and like, like I said it's just easier for the white pieces moves like knight to d7 you know take take d4 knight g6 rook b1 this is you know while it's zeros according to the engine it's far easier for the white pieces to play this especially because being a Vienna player, I've played this end, this is kind of endgame a lot. So we have takes, takes, knight, c6. I think I said during the game, I considered this a mistake. Computer calls it an inaccuracy, but from a human perspective, this is a horrible move. Because d4. Now the computer, the only reason it considers it an inaccuracy and not a mistake is by going for this same idea. But I feel like this is just the worst version of the previous variation because here I have d4 in already. If I wanted to go d4 in the previous one, he would take me en passant and get rid of his weakness. But here e5 is not really a weakness because it's supported by d4. This knight is also useless because like we saw in the game, it has no movement because of the way my pawn structure is set up. Moves like bishop g2 are going to probably win this pawn. It does not look good. Computer says plus 0.6. I don't know about plus 0.6. I'd probably give it like plus 1. Easily. So bishop e6. Knight e2. Now, I didn't go bishop to d3 here because I was worried about f6. And this doesn't work. Because if he goes g6, then we pick up a rook. But he doesn't have to do that. He can go bishop to f7. Our queen is forced back and then he takes. This does not look good for white so i chose knight to e2 rook b1 the engine likes but we kind of just played that interchangeably like you can play it whenever you want and say rook b1 queen c8 computer wants to develop with knight h3 i mean knight e2 as well it quite likes so i consider knight e2 a good move g5 was just what? The computer still wants to go for this to trade the queens, but the problem is after d4 has been played, like I just explained, it's so easy for white. Bishop g2, how are you going to defend yourself? Like, I have no idea. 
Bishop e7 takes. This is the top computer line, by the way. Rook to d8. <sighs> this looks pretty damn miserable. I don't see how this is point, plus point 0.7. I have no idea how the computer is justifying this. Knight f4. Bishop c4. This is pretty grim. So he goes g5, which I assume is to stop my knight from coming to f4. Again, computer lights rook b1. We go knight g3, but we're going to play rook b1 at some point anyway. h6 defends the pawn, which I wasn't even threatening to take it, so I don't understand. I thought g4 was the idea. And queen f2 staying on the f file. h5. I mean, this just isn't scary because I have the f5 square. And these pawns look really goofy. Apparently it's kind of alright after h3. What if we just go g3? I'm taking white here any day of the week. I'm going to castle kingside. I'm going to play rook b1. I'm going to get this bishop out at some point. Maybe it's okay. But this is, this is tough. This is tough. I don't understand why you'd do that. Knight g3 h6. And rook b1, queen c8, and here I play knight to um, knight to h5. Now, bishop d3, the computer slightly prefers, but again, I think it's pretty interchangeable. Um, I did say I would look at queen f6 here. And after rook g8, I didn't see what the plan was. Apparently, knight to h5 and bishop to d3 are still good moves. But I felt like the f6 square was better for the knight rather than the queen. Which is why I played knight h5, which the computer prefers. Knight e7 again, it, that was just odd. I was expecting bishop e7, and then I was going to give this check. King d7. And I thought this was just very good. I thought it was just a very nice position. Bishop d3, we're going to castle. We don't even have to do anything here. We just go, look, you can't castle. Your queenside pieces look absolutely ridiculous. Why is your king on d7? You have no threats. This was my plan. And we can take this bishop any time we like. So knight e7 was played. And bishop a3 is the best move. Again, bishop to d3 is still good, but I thought bishop a3 was a bit better. My point was, if black does nothing, if black does absolutely nothing, then knight f6, king d8, and we can probably just go bishop d3 and just freeze the black position so we can castle king side. Black really can't move. If he tries to come like back to c6 or something, we're just going to swap bishops off again. We're getting rid of his dark squared defender since he just weakened all of his dark squares. We can castle, we can take on d5. Computer was wanting ideas like c4 to be played, but it's not necessary. It's not necessary to go into all of those complications um, when you can just play simple chess, right? But bishop a3, knight g6, knight to f6 jack apparently isn't the best. Again, the computer wants c4. It also likes bishop takes f8. But I thought after bishop f8, king f8, black was like kind of okay. Because bishop d3, bishop g4. But apparently we have queen f6. And the point is if you take here, then we take on g6. Bishop takes, we win the rook. If I had calculated that line, maybe I would have played it. But again, there's also no need to overcomplicate things and allow our opponent play with a move like bishop to g4. So why not just give the check, trade the bishops, and take on d5? Objectively, not the best move. But practically, we just win a pawn. The, uh, queen d7, knight back to f6, queen to c6. We could take. I was at considering this move, like I said. And after here, here, maybe bishop a2. Apparently we can trap the bishop with, with um, c4, which didn't cross my mind. But even if we don't trap the bishop, 
something like this, this, maybe bishop to e4. We're still crushing in this position. We are one pawn, but our knight's amazing, our bishop's amazing, our rook's amazing. But d5 is far more clinical and far more winning. Knight takes e5, take the queen. And by the way, black can't do anything else. Like, there's nothing. Our queen covers the c3 square. And if the queen goes to another safe square, like, say, queen to a4, we're just going to take here. And when he takes back, we can take on b7. Rook c8. Give a check. Move over. And we can actually just force a trade of queens here. Did I see this far into the future? No. But did I need to see this far into the future? Also, no. I know I'm completely winning because I'm just winning a piece. So knight e5, I calculate this variation because this is the critical variation. Takes, takes, takes. a3. I can go knight e4, but I didn't see the point in allowing this. But a, Oh, I see the point here. And when the king moves, you go c4. Okay, apparently there's some mate here. So let's say he goes the other way. Um, e7, c4, and his bishop's trapped. Although rook a b8, rook a1, can he do this? Ah, uh, here, here. Just knight c3. d8, king back, and the bishop is trapped. So that's a nice line. That's a nice line. a3 I chose, again, not because it's the best move, but because it's the simplest move. I just save the pawn and go, look, what are you going to do? King e7, knight e4. f5, I go to d2. I considered this, but I didn't want to allow bishop d5. Because why allow the pressure with moves like g4, right? I didn't see the point in going into all this. So I instead chose knight d2. So if bishop to d5 was played, then i will probably still go bishop c4, offer a bishop trade. And even if he plays like this, then I could just take, even though, again, it's not the best move and it fixes his structure a bit. I'm up a knight. Knight b3. Um, I don't know. c6. You can bring the knight to c5, maybe. This is pretty damn good to me because we're just up a piece, even if his pawn structure is a bit better. So king f6. Bishop c4, he goes back. Like I said, if he takes, we're just up a knight. Yeah, so he drops back to c8, and we go king f2. Rook d8, rook d h to d1. And we are threatening now knight to e4 check, picking up the rook like we played in the game, but in a different move order. Bishop d7, rook b7. I thought that bishop d7 was him admitting that he saw knight e4. But maybe not. Maybe this was just his plan to come to e8. But it was odd to do it in two moves rather than do it in one move. But whatever. We take on c7. Rook a b8. We take on a7. Here, I believed taking the pawns was the easiest route because you can't do this because of knight e4 check. Yes, I could have gone bishop b3. The computer prefers knight e4. Um, and we're going to win the rook at some point. But for now, our rook is tied down to the defense of the knight. And if we move our knight to attack the rook, then our rook's going to hang. So again, knight e4 is nice and easy. Takes, takes, takes. Bishop e7 isn't best. King e3 is better, but I didn't want to allow rook takes h2 because then the h pawn is a passed pawn. Although this bishop is hanging, so he can't take it anyway. Takes on c3, king d4 attacks the rook. He goes here, we win this. So maybe I should have seen this. Again, bishop e2. I kind of caused a few problems for myself unnecessarily. Rook d6 I considered, but I wasn't sure about king e5. Apparently you just take this, and after this... Oh, you're getting... Black's getting mated. And if he takes with the bishop... Oh, the computer just wants to give... The bishop up and push the pawns yeah no i'm not playing that that's no need to play that rook f8 i thought was better because now well you saw what happened in the game with rook takes c3 
and if he takes on f3, this is mate, which I did actually spot. So if he takes on f3 with the bishop, then we just trade everything. Takes, 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 takes on c3, g2, e4, whatever, pretty interchangeable. And it's game over. I'm up a rook. So after we take on e4, after rook takes c3, he goes g4, which is just odd because we take and win a bishop. I guess the point is that he didn't want to get mated. But yeah, rook c2, take on h5. And we do find the mate in 6. We do find the mate in 6. Did I know it was mate in 6? No, but I was just playing the most logical checks in order to force the king to the edge of the board and potentially mate him, which materialized. So that's the game. If you made it to the end of the video, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.